it's Ryan Tierney from Lean Made Simple. We're on day two of the Two Second Lean Summit and our next speaker presentation is by Mark Braun. And Mark talks a lot about coaching and about being coachable. And this is one of those talks where you should pause it, take notes and really internalize what's going on because there's lots of wisdom in this next talk. So I really hope you enjoy the next speaker presentation by Mark Braun. We are gonna talk about uh, my favorite topic, coaching. And it's what I've actually seen present here with Paul. He has two of his coaches here. <sighs> what an honor to meet you. Every leader at every level is what I'm going to be speaking about. Building coaching into every leader at every level, it's actually foundational to the whole process. I want to start with the people growth side. NASA actually needed engineers that were creative. They needed what we think we do whenever we went over to the City Matters team, we met creative people. Everybody agree? People were creating. NASA said we need more creative engineers, and so they did a study of 1,600 people over a lifetime. So there was a longitudinal study. They started at age five, and then tested them again at age 10, at 15, and then as adults. These are the results they found. At age five, anybody got any five-year-olds? They are creative geniuses. 98% of age five, when they tested them, were creative geniuses. They could come up with all kinds of creative solutions. They took the same 1,600 people and tested them at age 10. They had lost 70% of them. By age 15, only 12%. And as adults, uh, 2%. Now, I will say we've got an overpopulation here of creative folks. You have signed up for an event that's basically a creative event. It's under a topic called Lean, which is about how do you get continuous improvement. So we got more than 2% of us here. You've heard Paul say it only works in about 2% of the people. Philippe? About 2%. Here's the part that I want you to see, the part in red. I wrote it in my hand because it means so much to me. Unlocking that creative genius inside of those humans is actually the only job we get paid for as leaders. I want to ask you a question about what the, where we went and saw at CD Matters. How many people do you think, out of 100, if we sent them into CD Matters at age 20, do you think they could start creating in that system and start making improvements? How many? Give me a number. How many? No, I want a number. 100%? Wow, that's high. I love it. 98. I believe a lot of them. What Paul did for us was such a freaking gift. I'm, I'm a magical person in the complex world. I make things more complex. I'll overcomplicate anything. You'll talk to me and you'll be like, damn, he's complicated. Paul is a m miraculous simplifier. You know, we saw a gift yesterday. Why is he so simple? Why does he need it so simple? He'd fail if it wasn't so simple. So he wrote it for himself because he knew that people needed it. Thank you for writing it. It is the clearest, most simple, tiniest element. Like it's the down, like here, I think a five-year-old could get it. Just meet every day and talk about improvement. See if you can do that with a heart for growing people. And just, just see what people can come up with. And then celebrate them. Wow. Powerful. Life changing. So thank you, Paul. It is not the end of lean. You can't stop there if you're going to build a scaled up organization that keeps on building and growing. It's not the finish line. It's the starting line. Uh, this is my team back at Cambridge Engineering. If you guys, who has been to Cambridge? Who's been more than once? Yeah. Here's uh, Paul in the front, my dear friend John Kramer, and a crazy lean maniac, Carl Wadston. I'm the baldy with the microphone. I had the privilege of coming into Cambridge. It was, my, it was some of my funnest work. I was there for 13 years. My normal assignment is three and out. I grow something and leave. I was there for 13 years. Do you know why? Because it was so freaking fun because we were growing people and having a fun, lean culture. I loved it. Um, 
We held this event there in 2017, honored to hold it. People were saying, somewhat like Philippe said, you know, not very many people are succeeding at it. Well, I was like, well, come on, we'll bring them to our place and show them at least. See how it works. It's not easy, but it sure is powerful. This was our growth before. So I was brought in to grow the company because I love growing companies. John had asked me to come in. He was a friend. He said, my wife told me I need to hire you, and I don't hire friends, and you're a friend, so I've got a problem. I said, well, that sounds like a problem for you. And so he invited me into a vision that was big. He's got this beautiful heart for people, a beautiful faith in a loving God. And he said, I want to build this business really big and care for people, but I don't know how. I mean, I was like, I could tell that. He didn't know how. That's okay. You can't do it alone. There's no way to build this alone. I, I could feel the vision, though, from him. You think Ryan and Martin are building this alone? You think Jonathan and the three of them are building it alone? Does anybody think that? No, they're inviting people into a vision that's bigger than them so that they can go build it with them. That is beautiful. I got invited into that. I want you to see that Two Second Lean started here. It was actually an answer to a problem. Most of the time when I walked in, John would say, operations are horrible. And I'd look at operations, I'm like, I started, I started an operation, I'm like, no, they're actually fine, we gotta go grow this company. So we went over to sales and started growing, and then guess what, we hit a, hit a place where operations wasn't growing as fast, and all the engine, the continuous improvement engine, wasn't down at the floor. Anybody got that? So a few guys went up to Paul's and saw it, and they're back, they send me the book, I read it because it's on Audible, I don't read very well. I'm a five-year-old on reading, so I have to listen to things. So I listened to it in about an hour at about 2x speed, because that's how I listen. And I was like, this is it. He has the purpose of grow people. I can't be fun by myself. I need that. And he's got a simple plan we could do. So we started doing it. I love that. And that's what allowed us to keep on growing, and they're doing it now. I stayed there for 13 years, and I lied just a little earlier. Why did I stay? For 13 years, I only come in to fix things and then I leave. That's what I do. I love it. It's my favorite thing in the world. So why did I stay for 13 years? The answer I gave from the front of the stage was I was having too much fun, right? But the real answer was I was scared to leave. I had one person ready to take on my role as president seven years before I left. Two people ready to take on the president role four years before I left. Three people ready to take on the president's role when I left. I normally only wait for one. <laughs> How many do you wait for before you turn over your role to the next person? If you're the supervisor, if you're the operations leader and you got people underneath you and you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna give you the job because I'm in it. I'm not, yeah, yeah, it's not gonna happen because I'm, I'm, I'm in the role and I'm good. I gotta stay in the role. That's what normally happens. We actually look at other people and we say, they're probably scared to pass on their knowledge of welding or they're probably scared to pass on their knowledge. They're probably scared of getting lean because they wouldn't be a valuable person. Well, I was scared. I spent 60% of my time coaching other people. Coaching was my job. 40% was something else. I don't even remember. But I loved the 60%. And that's why they kept on growing. They were incredible. Watching them grow, they were like, wow. They keep on making different improvements. And some of them are very tiny, and some of them are very big. But they're all stepping out of their comfort zone, believe, and growing. So um, the goal that we had at the time, and the goal that I would suggest you put in place for yours, we were growing our leaders even faster than the company. That's what I saw yesterday. You actually have excess leadership capacity. Those people out there are all leaders. Congratulations. You're deployable. Anything you need to go do, you could deploy leaders to. Guess what? You got a big challenge in front of you. You bring in 200 people and you got to get them through in one hour and a half. Or that's excess leadership. You have it. When I saw you the first time and you were doing two second lean, you hadn't grown yet. You had been using it. You said it yesterday. Three years in, you turned. That is beautiful. Yesterday, I saw your leadership in a way that I couldn't even imagine it, Brian. We can see people and watch them grow and learn and, and lead. And when they get to the point where there's excess leadership capacity, they can be used. 
when we're using a sports engine, we love, I love, uh, I'm not a car guy, but I love um, Paul's cars, and I love a lot of people's cars. And for me, this picture is just, we would love for the thing to be an engine, but some of us are running at the red line. Our, our engines are, like, all the way out, and we're, like, scraping. And a lean company like yesterday, they actually have excess capacity. I don't know where you were yesterday, but it looked like about four. You still could have taken on more. I was like, what are they holding back for? You got more capacity. Your leadership capacity is amazing. And you're launching things. I can see it. That's awesome. That's what we're all trying to build is a car that's not all redlined all the time. I want you to make one shift in your leadership. Actually, two questions first. How much excess leadership do you have in your company right now? Excess leadership capacity. Oh, I want to go grow. Okay. Yeah. Where does growth come from when it's healthy, sustainable growth? Like, you want to go acquire a company? Guess what? It takes leadership to do that. You want to go expand into a new market? It takes leadership to do that. You want to go? It takes leadership. So how much excess leadership capacity have you built in the engine? Uh, how many people on your team are ready to take on the next level role or your role? My goal as a coach and as a leader, which I put together as one person, is to grow people into my role as fast as I can. I've been doing it for 30 years. I love it. It's my favorite thing in the world to do. How fast can I get the other person that's working with me and right now in a role that's not mine, how fast can I get them to be able to do my role? So Lucas, how many people do you have ready to do your role? Not enough. Not enough. How fast can you get them ready to do your role? It's your only job. Keep them, get them, go grow. When I think about whether I give the person the presentation or not, I say, well, they could do the presentation or I could, and all I ask is one single question. Would they grow faster if I were to do it, or would they grow faster if they were to do it? Sometimes the answer is they would grow faster if I would do it because they might puke in the corner and not actually get up there on the stage, and it would be okay. That would be too fast. Okay. So it's just one single question. How fast can we get our leadership replaced? Um, I want you to make one shift in your leadership to do that. And I believe it's at the core of lean. It's before Paul got to two-second lean. And that is to stop controlling as a manager and start encouraging as a coach. And I don't mean the encouraging kind of cheerleading. You hear that the <laughs> sometimes Paul will correct you as well as cheer for you, correct? Everybody, has everybody felt that before? I hope that he'll do that for me after this. But the goal is encouraging. To breathe courage into another human being, you can either applaud for them, that is encouraging, or you can correct them. If your correction is for them and for their betterment and, and helping them get to the vision that they have in their head of what they want to be in the world, boy, oh boy, it feels good. So I want you to shift out of high gear, which is too high and it's redlining, from a controlling as a manager to encouraging as a coach. So I want to play a quick video on coachability. Watch this with me, and then I'll ask you a couple questions. Let's see if the audio works. Play by yourself. Why by yourself? Can I help? No. I'll help. I don't. You can help one more out to you, okay? You can help when we are out to you. Do you have, okay. do you have this to see? Probably. You want me to help, Rose? No. Thank you. No, thank you. What do you want me to do? Worry about yourself. Don't worry. Worry about yourself. <laughs> I'll do this one, so I'm going to do that. You drive! You drive! You drive! You drive! All right, how did she do on a scale of 1 to 10 on coachability? <laughs> scale of 1 to 10. Zero! She's pretty low, right? How did she do on cute? Yeah, 10. What did you like about her? Give me some of the positive traits you saw in her. Independence. She wanted to learn to solve the problem by herself. Focus. Confident. Persistent from the back. Never give up. Man, that's awesome. I love that. What about on her ability to be coached? 
I've got three things I would like you to write them down, but you don't have to. Three things that mean coachability to me, and I look for in every hire I have, every leader that I see. That's the courage, humility, and discipline to be coachable. The courage to step out of your comfort zone and try things you haven't tried before. To get to where you want to go. The humility to acknowledge that I'm not doing it perfectly right now. And the discipline to be able to change my own habits and practice new habits, to change them as, and adjust them. If you're a leader, that means the courage to try to lead in a way that you're a little uncomfortable with. The humility to know you're not leading the best you could lead. And the discipline to put new leadership behaviors in place to get what you wanted to get. I just saw all three with my friend, Philippe. The courage to change his behaviors, try things new, get out of his comfort zone. I can't believe he was wearing pants either, Brad, after that. The humility to acknowledge in front of all of you that he hasn't gotten there. You've actually been leading in a way with behaviors in a way that hasn't built the culture that you want, Philippe. And he's willing to adjust his behaviors, and I believe all in my heart that he'll go back and adjust his behaviors to get what he wants. And that's what we all need to be doing here. What do we need to adjust about our own leadership? Our, our, our culture's not getting what we want. Oh, shoot, there must be some behavior that you're doing that's not actually the behavior that you need to do to get the things that you want. Coachability is not talked about in Paul's book, but it's shown and demonstrated. The courage, the humility, and discipline are all over that thing. But when it's in a book, it looks like he kind of knows what he's talking about, doesn't it? It kind of looks like he knows it, <laughs> like I know everything. It's like, here it is, I got it. That's the answer. And it's published. He pushed publish. So I had to see the man. Like, what is this man? So I go to Japan and I watch him and he's learning. He's on his knees learning. He's like learning, deeply learning. He already wrote the book. He already knows everything. He's deeply learning. He's studying. And guess who he's studying for? Who he's studying from? These two gentlemen, uh, Rich Yoshingo, Norm and Bodek. He is sitting there at their feet saying, I learned everything from them because they were my coaches. When he's out in front of you and there's no coaches present, he might say, I know exactly what I'm doing because he's the coach in the room, right? He might be correcting you. Sometimes you're an incredible encourager. And he will correct you. Our coaches, coaching is not actually just cheerleading. It's not just clapping. You actually have to correct. The best coaches in the world don't just sit there and watch a player on the field running all over the place and say, that was awesome. Philippe, if we coach a person with a bad improvement and we go like this, that was awesome, and we don't see the person and we don't help them correct, then we haven't done our coaching job. I want you to reflect on who's the most encouraging human being that you've ever been in contact with, leader, coach, teacher, someone in your life that you've ever been coached by that's done this kind of thing, that's clapped or corrected. Get them in your brain. And I want you to think about what they did. What did they do? What were their behaviors? Does anybody have one in their head? <laughs> Who is it? I, he wasn't an encourager. Bob Taylor is my mentor, my lifetime mentor, Taylor Guitars, and he was not necessarily an encourager. He was just brutally honest with me all the time. Yeah. And for me, that's what I needed and that's what I wanted. And what did it do for you? How did it get your actions? Did you do more because of it? It gave me tremendous courage because he set the example of courage. Okay. So here's the problem. We just heard it from, from Paul. He said it, Bob Gibson, correct? Bob Taylor. Bob Taylor, sorry. Bob Taylor with Gibson Guitars. No. Taylor Guitars. I apologize. Taylor right, I'm going to start over Gibson. for the video. So Bob Taylor from Taylor Guitars. And you said real quickly, he wasn't an encourager. And then you said he was brutally honest, 
corrected you often, right? Yes. And then I asked you, what actions did you take after? And you said, I had the courage. I got courage. Okay. So there's a encouragement, my definition, you can look it up anywhere you want, uh, under Mark D. Braun. Uh, encourage is to breathe courage into another human being that they've gained, you've gained from something. So if you've got experiences and you correct, that could be encouragement. Here's the problem with encouragement. It has to actually, ha the transaction has to complete. The other human being on the other side has to have more courage after you've talked with them than before. So Paul had more courage. He already admitted to everybody publicly, correct? Everybody see, hear that? He had more courage after the transaction with, with Bob Taylor. But he didn't view him as an encourager. But after the transaction, he had more courage. Correct? So, who's right? Was, he an, was, was Bob Taylor an encourager or not? Yes? Who thinks yes? Raise your hand if you think Bob Taylor was an encourager. Okay, we have all hands up. You're wrong. Yeah, I never thought about the word before, but look at no, this. No, 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 no. Look we at the wrong. word. In courage. We have to wrong. give courage. Yeah, you're okay with it then. What, did you change your answer? You, you said he wasn't an encourager. He wasn't a rah-rah, he wasn't no. a cheerleader, but we interpret encouraging as a cheerleader, and maybe it isn't necessarily. Okay, so we proved Paul wrong one time over the time. Thank you very much. That's all we had to do. Give a round of applause. Thank you very much. I love you. I love your heart for others and the way you serve, and you are an encourager to so many people in this group. Right now, you have a disconnect between encouragement and clapping. Bob didn't clap for you. He challenged you, which gave you courage to go out and do great things. I want you to know that that is encouragement, and you do it for people. Yeah, I, I just never thought about it that way. I understand. Well, maybe, I, I maybe you'll change. I learned today. Yeah. So, this is um, one of my favorite encouragers. Richie Oshingo, uh, Paul actually introduced me to as one of his coaches. And I watched and I said, oh my gosh, Paul is learning so much from this man. I want to learn from this man. So Richie came over to our plant and he started seeing our things. And, you know, there's a lot of clapping in Cambridge. We clap well. And what, what we do is correct in private. We don't correct in public. Richie has a different method of encouragement. He corrects in public. So I'm walking along as the president of Cambridge, and we've got a pretty nice plant, and he is hitting me. He hit me 16 times on the arm. He said, he said, no, Moxon, no, that is your problem. He called out every area that was a challenge, and he hit the president of the company on the arm and said, that is your fault. That's your responsibility. You need to take care of that. In front of all of my people, guess what I had after that visit? What? Bruise. Bruise, yeah? What did I have? What? Somebody yell it. Paul had it after Bob Taylor. Courage, courage. yeah. I had, I had courage like steel. I was like, we're going to go kick, we're going to knock down the world. He had hit me 16 times, told me how bad it was all over the place, and I had courage coming out of my pores. He had been an encouragement to me. This man could do it somehow magically with no, no applause. But the, the aim was to breathe courage into a young leader who he had traveled far to see. After an invitation to come over, please come to my plant. Yes, I'll come, but you need to listen. Yes, I'll listen. Come at f I'll need to be there at 5 o'clock in the morning. I will be there with you at 5 o'clock in the morning, walking through every part of this, this plant. He could see that I was trainable, <laughs> coachable. You need to be coachable. Paul was coachable. If you've tried to coach him, I would suggest, and you haven't succeeded, I would suggest you might be not the right coach for him. I would maybe turn it around and let, let him be the coach for you. But if he turns and he shifts... Keep going. This is a book that I have used in my coaching practice, and I really like it. I want to give it uh, to you because I really enjoy it. It's what got you here won't get you there. It's not by me, but it is a fact. <laughs> we heard it from Brendan yesterday. And some of us think that the process that got us to here, if we just keep on going, will get us there. And it's, 
It, you know, it could be true. It's actually not true on scaling companies. As you build and grow companies, you actually have to start doing things differently. And you have to know what to do differently. As we think about our own behaviors, I want you to look up a list. And if you want, I'll give you a link later. But there's 40 bad habits that we have as leaders on this list. And I love reading them and going, oh, yeah, I've got that one. Oh, yeah, I can do that one. And some of it is discouraging to our team. Not correcting to our team, it's discouraging to our team. And we don't want to discourage them, we want to correct them. Um, I want to end with a, a, a coach of mine, Gary Ridge. Gary Ridge is the past uh, CEO of WD-40. He's built an incredible global organization. Uh, WD-40, does anybody know WD-40? Yeah? Yeah. He's a good one. Uh, he's just, uh, just exited and now he's chairman. And, uh, and I want you to hear what he thinks about coaching at the highest level in organizations. Not from a lean perspective, but lean at the best. Let me first talk about the value of, of, of coaches as leaders within the organization. And it's really based on one premise, is that we as individuals are not capable of maximizing our opportunities on our own. So our job is to do whatever we need to do to build the relationship between ourselves and those we have the privilege to lead. And the whole concept of coaching is about, I'm not, I'm not here to do your job. I'm here to help you do your best job. So if we think about a coach, the way we would think about the coach of a soccer team, what are some of the principles of a coach. Number one is a great coach never ever runs onto the playing field. A lot of people think coaching is about micromanaging and it's not at all. A great coach never ever tries to score the, the goal for the player. A great coach spends a lot of time on the sideline observing the play and identifying how the player can improve their play to win the game that they want to win. So, which is really important. So as a coach, I'm not, I'm here to help you win. I'm not here to play the game for you, micromanage you or do anything else around that. The other thing that's important is a great coach spends a lot of time in the locker room because the locker room is where you build trust. So it's that engagement with those people. That's really, really important. So you know, it's got to be someone who, who, who is comfortable and always there to have that conversation. I just want to end it there, but um, he is an incredible human being, and I get to be coached by him, and I'm watching him because I've never led publicly traded companies, and he had to not only answer to his people, but also to the board and also to the public, and that's a skill set I need. So whenever I need the skill set, I call a coach. <laughs> because I need to learn faster than I learned before. I'll finish with this slide. Um, Maya Angelou is a wonderful poet. If you ever get a chance to read her work, uh, incredible. She says this, courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You are in the courage transaction business. You are encouraging other human beings to grow and you're setting up systems to do that. If you think of yourself, if coaching is a helpful mindset to think of it. Sensei would be another word. I can tell you Rizio Shingo knew his purpose in life was to give his knowledge to others and to help them grow. That was his ikigai. I got to be privileged like Paul did, like you can be with others, to be able to get that encouragement from others. But then you can go, go out and encourage others yourself. It'll take your courage yourself to grow and learn It'll take your courage to be coachable because it's not easy to take corrective advice from people and to take correction from outside. Do it intentionally, do it on purpose, and then give that forward freely. And reach out anytime. Um, this is uh, just a LinkedIn post right there. If you connect with me, I would love to connect with everybody here. I just love this community. And so I don't know that we have time for questions, but uh, just wanted you to know, stay coachable. Stay humble, stay courageous, disciplined, and go out and encourage others. Thank you.